Although negativity feeds the algorithm, my media diet consists mainly of new content which I have a reason to believe I will enjoy. The older you get, the less time you have and the more important your time becomes. After disappointments like The Book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi, there wasn't much hope left in me for Star Wars. Until Andor released, which became an outlier, a show for adults which could compete with current prestige television like House of the Dragon and The Boys. Conversely, The Acolyte attracted my attention not because of praise, but the overwhelming negativity surrounding the show. To begin with, showrunner Leslie Headland worked four years as personal assistant to Harvey Weinstein. Though Headland has denied any knowledge of Weinstein's actions at the time, her history of working for a sexual predator has drawn criticism from detractors. Headland has directed two feature films, Bachelorette and Sleeping with Other People, both relationship comedies, neither one suggesting that Headland would be the best fit for a live-action Star Wars show. Headland's wife plays a Jedi leader in the show, and she didn't get the job because she's a great actor. The Jedi don't emote much. They look like a bunch of boring nerds cosplaying in the woods, and are actually the antagonists of the season, a group of stiff space cops who cover up murder to protect their own skin. The show's conflict involves a moral gray area by establishing the protagonist past the dark side as a necessary action because, as there is no empire yet, the Jedi are the authoritarians. It makes the Sith sympathetic, which is at odds with canon because it's a Sith Lord who becomes the fascist emperor by the time you get to OG Star Wars. The most charismatic character is the murderous Sith Lord who the viewers have dubbed Smilo Ren, or Asian Ezra Miller. He comes in and gets rid of all the one-note Jedi characters and seduces the lead to the dark side. Her lightsaber changes color to really hammer it home. The massacre of the Jedi in a lightsaber fight is the show's best action, but why should I care about the death of the characters of Yord or Jackie after they've had little screen time and no character development? The Acolyte suffers from the same problems which plagued the Book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi. The episodes are too short padded out by long credits. The dialogue is written for children. Character engagements are as detailed as one saying, the Jedi are good, and the other responding, the Jedi are bad. Episode 3 is a flashback episode, which makes the mistake of centering the whole episode around child actors. I won't blame children for giving bad performances, because it's really the fault of the director. This is also the episode where a coven of witches perform a ritual which has all the energy of a local theater production. Seeing this clip out of context is what gave me a reason to watch the show, and I laughed even harder when I saw the actual episode. The power Just to be clear, this show is not supposed to be a comedy. Okay. There's a very thin line in fantasy between what an audience will take seriously and what an audience will find unintentionally humorous. Episode 7 tells the exact same story as Episode 3. It uses much of the same footage from different camera angles. The season is only 8 episodes, each one between 30 and 40 minutes, including credits, and 2 episodes include the same information. During the credits to Episode 7, a pop song begins playing, which is tonally inconsistent with the rest of the show. When Obi-Wan Kenobi included young Luke and Leia as characters, it risked muddying the established lore set by the original trilogy. By inserting a traumatic event into Luke's life, which was never mentioned before, it felt more like fan fiction than canon. The Acolyte commits a similar sin to diehard purists. Who was his father? There was no father. The myth of the virgin birth is connected to Joseph Campbell's concept of the hero's journey, influential on George Lucas when creating Star Wars. In The Acolyte, the twin protagonists precede Anakin as an archetypal chosen one, upsetting fans who feel his significance has been undercut by this addition. The main characters of Osha and May are both played by Amanda Stenberg. Stenberg isn't a bad actor. She was good as the lead in Bodies, 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 a darkly funny satire on the behavior of Gen Z, but her performance isn't great here. The two characters are essentially supposed to be the same person, 
It should have been an opportunity to show off some acting chops with two lead roles, but it falls flat. Both House of the Dragon and The Boys this season were able to incorporate one actor into two roles more effectively. The protagonists make life-changing decisions suddenly, without any signal to the audience as to why this is supposed to make sense. May immediately decides to betray her Sith Master when she finds out Osha is alive, and Osha betrays the Jedi's soul as soon as he confesses his crime to her. May has already killed one Jedi and convinced another to drink poison when she decides to switch her allegiance. Osha only has to witness the villain's muscular naked body before she is swayed to the dark side. Or maybe it was the evil helmet she tried on. Kurtosis, handy against lightsabers. The Acolyte is now the live-action debut of fan-favorite villain Darth Plagueis, in cameo form as he peeks out from a cave. Yoda is teased in the final shot as well, but neither character has a single line of dialogue. It's fan service at its most hollow. Soul is played by Lee Jung Jae, who rose to fame as the lead in Squid Game. He learned English for this role, and even though his heavy accent makes his dialogue hard to understand sometimes, it's him and Manny Jacinto as the Sith Lord who carry the show. Like Boba Fett or Obi-Wan, this story could have been told more efficiently as a two-hour movie. If you defend a heavily politicized piece of media, then you appear to be a corporate shill. And if you criticize one, then you're seen as a clout-chasing grifter. But it's not the diversity of the cast, or the ideology of the showrunner, which makes The Acolyte an underwhelming experience. It strives for a complex narrative, beyond classic good versus evil storytelling, but the execution is lackluster to say the least. When it comes to the logical problems of fire in the vacuum of space, or fire spreading in a stone structure, even good Star Wars had explosions in space. It's fantasy rather than realistic science fiction, but the Acolyte is suffering from an identity crisis, neither a fun adventure nor a serious character drama. It's not simply alterations to the lore which drag the show down, the birthday of a minor character, Kai Adi Mundi, being changed from the books is inconsequential because in general, adaptations don't have to follow the source material. The Acolyte is a prequel to the Star Wars prequels, which had a mixed reception upon release but have built a cult following over time, even though they're filled with clumsy writing, stiff acting, and an over-reliance on CG. If you're the kind of viewer who wants nothing more than to clap and cheer when a Wookiee whips out a lightsaber, you might enjoy the Acolyte, but if you're looking for something deeper, seek elsewhere.